I'm Pastor Brandon Briscoe, and welcome to another episode of The Postscript, Living Faith Bible Institute's weekly podcast and YouTube series, where we interview pastors and professors from across the Living Faith Fellowship on topics ranging from ministry to theology to, to what God's just doing in the life of that pastor. And, and we're hoping that it that it strengthens you, it, it, it grows you, it, it pushes you into greater devotion in ministry and uh, yielding to the Lord. This week, I'm interviewing Pastor Mark Trotter, and we're having a conversation about how to balance ministry and family, which is a really hard thing to do. The further along you get into ministry and the more your family grows, you're, you're constantly working through transitions and, and difficulties, how to manage your time, your energy, your resources, and then to properly communicate that stuff. It can be really hard sometimes. And, and Pastor Mark has had 40 years of ministry experience. He's raised a family. And so we're hoping to pick his brain this week about how to do all of that and so welcome back pastor mark trotter hey brandon good to see you thanks for having me yeah so let's just dig right into it if you okay, don't mind sure how long have you been married to sherry uh your, your wonderful wife she's I, the best she's part so of me sweet. man she's <laughs> like one of the sweetest people i've ever met me too yeah and the 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 beautiful thing is is she's just as sweet when we're home as she is out in public man you yeah there's no way that that's fake you can't you can't fake that that's yeah man and she got it honestly because her mama she is her mama wow and uh and so yeah that has uh let me just say this in terms of ministry and family mm -hmm. Choose wisely. Yeah, good call. Good, that's a very good point. Point number one. Point, yes. That is so major, and, and maybe we'll even talk a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so, so how long have you guys been married? So we got married in March of 79, so we uh, are 41 years uh, okay. married now. 41 years of marriage, 40 years of of ministry, full-time ministry, right? Yeah, well, and yeah, so uh, the way that it worked is we get, we got married on March 4th, 1979. Two weeks later, we started our first job in the ministry in Huntington mm -hmm. Beach, California. So wow. our anniversary of marriage and ministry- They're right by each other. Right there, okay. yes. Yeah, so- um, Man, so doing it, just the two of you, that was probably really exciting in the beginning because you were, you were somewhat flexible. You guys moved around a little bit, right? Yeah, we uh, we started in Huntington Beach. We were there for three years. Uh, the thing that was cool about, uh, about being there is my best friend from Miami that got saved the same day that I did. Uh, he was the youth pastor uh, and I was the singles guy. And so we were both uh, newly married, we got to hang out, uh, and you know, Friday nights we're we're I'm with my best friend, and my wife was her best friend. Yeah, that's fun. And so it it was uh, it it was good. Mm. Uh, and so we could complain with each other, and we, we could rejoice with each other, and all those kinds. Yeah, of Yeah, it's important to have friends in ministry. Sure. That's that's a huge part of this Absolutely. is having people that you can talk to. Yes, because when you don't have that, I mean. Oh yeah, you, yeah, you can go nuts, yeah. man. So you, um, how long were you married before you guys had kids? Uh, not real long, uh, two years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Justin was the first, and then uh, how long before you you had your daughter? Well, Justin was a strong-willed child. Oh, okay. So you uh, gave it some time before. Well, we we went <laughs> four and a half years between because we okay. were like. Whew, yeah, yeah. This is a lot of work. Sure. And uh, you know, it uh th then we had our daughter and she was not strong-willed. Uh my uh, you know, yeah. So that was that was a blessing, but that was the reason for the gaposis. Yeah, you needed some time there. to work through uh, yes. how to do it. <laughs> so, um so where were you uh by the time you had two, where were you guys at? Were you at, you weren't at New Philly yet? Were you? Yes, JC okay. was born in in New Philly. Okay, mm -hmm. and so you are um, not yet the head pastor, your associate pastor at this time, right. I assume. Mm -hmm. And so you've got your little family, and you're doing your thing. I, I guess the thing that that I want to ask is, as your responsibility in ministry 
began to grow and increase. How did you prepare your family for that as you were getting kind of pulled around and, and called in different directions? I mean, what, what did that look like for you and, and how did they respond? Was that always easy? Was, you know, well, it was definitely not always easy. Uh, but I, I will tell you this there, I, I, when I was in Bible college, mm-hmm. I heard somebody, I, I can't even remember who it was, told me a story and I don't want to use this man's name, sure. but he was a very famous preacher, uh, in one of the major cities in our country in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. I mean, uh, the, everybody would know the name mm-hmm. and a, a good solid guy, you know. Not, yeah, yeah. And uh, they were telling me that he uh, had an office at, at his home, and every morning from 6 till noon, he was in that office studying the Word of God. And, of course, we would all applaud that. Mm-hmm. He had a little girl that just wanted her daddy. Yeah. And knowing he's on, and when she would come in, no, honey, uh, daddy's studying right now. And uh, he ended up losing her. Uh, I, I, I don't mean to death, I mm-hmm. mean losing her to the, to world. the world. Yeah. And I heard that before I ever had kids. And I thought to myself, I'm never, God help me to never cause my kids to feel like the ministry stole their daddy. Mm. And so I, I can, I, that story helped me immensely. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I will say this, as you were saying, as you progress in ministry, you, you, you get more and more responsibility. It's mm-hmm. not like, you know, you, in a lot of jobs, you get into, you know, several more years. Cushy. Yes. Yeah. And it gets easier. No, man, the doors start opening and there's more and more ministry, uh, that, that takes place. And so I, I would just, um, say this, that what that is going to mean, what it meant for me, is less sleep mm. because you know you, there's only 24 hours in a day and if you're going to do everything that is required in ministry and you are going to be the the husband and the father that you need to be Ooh, man, that there are incredible demands and so you you definitely for a good period of time, about 25 years or so, where you better not love sleep. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a tough thought. <laughs> you know, that's a tough thought. But if you're going to be devoted fully to the cause of Christ and fully devoted to your family, something's got to give. You got to cut that out of some, some part of the pie. And an hour or two, three of sleep, I guess, is probably... <laughs> Maybe the only place left to take it from, huh? Yes, uh, getting more than an hour or two, but you're talking cutting an yeah, hour cutting. or yeah, two yeah, yeah. for sure. Did you have to? Did you have to learn to say no? Absolutely. So, so a lot of people struggle with that. Oh, how, how do you how do you uh, deal with that? Yeah. Well, I, I will tell you, I'm not the best at saying no. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, I mean, that's how I got you on the show today, actually. Because it's, I can't say yeah, no. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, and, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I think my problem with uh, saying no is uh, I'm a people pleaser mm-hmm. and and that can be a, a big, hairy sin. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I don't you, you know, we don't want to be offensive to people, but you can lose your family yeah. over being a people pleaser and not being able to say no. We've got to depend on God to give us the wisdom of when to say no. And, you know, the truth of the matter is there are a lot of people that are in our churches that uh, have unrealistic expectations of a pastor. Hmm. And, you know, they will they will run you ragged if you're going to try to meet their expectations. Right. And I, I will tell you, uh, we, through the years, lost people that uh, I did not meet their expectations. 
But to God be the glory, I I didn't lose my kids. Yeah, right. And right now, those people, they couldn't give you two cents for Mark Trotter, you know? And so if I would have spent my life pleasing them, I, it would have been a real bad choice. Yeah. And hey, losing people when you're in the ministry, it hurts, and man. you know all all of that that stuff. But at the end of the day, man, we've got a family that we're responsible yeah. to bring them up, or those kids, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And nurturing kids, you. You can't do that on the fly, man. No. You've got to spend time with them. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's it's the main thing that they want is time. Absolutely, right? and and so do our our wives. Yeah, and you know, if, if I, I don't want to take the this in a direction you don't want to go, but I will. You know, I was talking at the beginning with you know, kind of tongue in cheek with the choose wisely. I, I will say this, I. If I'm at all sounding like I'm some expert on all of this, I, I, I don't want to sound like that. I had the tremendous privilege of marrying a young lady that when she was eight years old, knew she wanted to marry a pastor. Mm -hmm. And uh, because she wanted to have that life i uh i have been the beneficiary of a wife that loves god loves people wants to minister to people and recognizes her ministry mm -hmm. is the ministry to me first mm -hmm. and foremost and helping the pastor to be the pastor, not by being the assistant pastor, mm -hmm. but by being my wife. Yeah. And I will tell you this. She has disappointed a lot of women through the years that wanted her time, but her time was devoted to helping me be the pastor that I needed to be by being the man I needed to be because I need a wife. I've read somewhere in a good book that he that finds a wife finds a good mm -hmm. thing and that it ain't good for a man to be alone. Yeah, right. And so the beautiful thing with my wife and in terms of if there's any young man out there that's thinking he's called to the ministry and when I say choose wisely, you know, uh, we have been called to be husbands, okay? This word husband, interesting word that God would choose this word to talk about a man's relationship with his wife. Mm -hmm. And the first time that the word shows up in the Bible is a husbandman. And so what happened is God took man out of the ground and he gave that man back to the ground as its tiller of mm -hmm. the soil, which yeah. is the husbandman. And so he was a gardener. Yeah, the That was his responsibility. Sure. And so God then takes a piece of that ground right under his heart, that rib, and fashions that into a woman and gives that woman someone to till that soil that is called a husband. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of a marriage, you know, what we are is we're gardeners. Yeah. And we, we've got to nurture that plant. And so with that plant, you've got to know what kind of plant that is. Right. How much sunlight does this plant need and how much water does it need? And, and when the plant is withering, it's not for the husbandman to come out to the garden and say, What's going on here? Why are you withering? Why are you got why you got all these brown leaves? The the gardener goes, something's happening with my plant and I need to be the husbandman mm -hmm. and figure out what's going on. Yeah. And so I you know, I think in ministry, boy, if you're gonna be uh the pastor you need to be, 
and have your wife be what she needs to be so she can be what she needs to be to you. And for this thing to actually work is a, a pastor needs to understand what kind of plant does he have yeah. and how much does he need to water. Yeah, You can water too much and you can get too much sunlight. So meaning you got to know your wife's personality what she loves what she hates um you know what kind of what kind of love does she actually receive what, you know what is she looking for what's her mind what's she thinking and uh, and meeting her in that place in order to properly cultivate or, or reap what you desire because that's what you're getting at right it is you see that those plants that adam was to be tilling that soil it was so they could produce the fruit that god intended those plants to produce right i the way that i b believe god set this thing up in marriage is man this wife can produce incredible fruit if the husbandman will nurture her properly mm -hmm. and and so you know i think in ministry We've got to constantly be looking into the eyes of that plant and saying, wow, I, I think, you know, I need to start saying no to some things and saying yes to her. Yeah. And so it's just being aware of your plant. And, you know, I, I will, you know, the in and this this is opinion right now. OK, okay. so I'll just preface it with yeah. that, that. If you're going to be in the ministry, I, I will tell you, the, the demands are great. And so if, you know, there, there's some people, God love them. It, you know, I'm not dissing anybody, but there's some people that are just needy people. And if I were choosing for the ministry, I would be choosing a plant that is not needy because you're going to be hamstrung. In, in the ministry, because if your wife isn't producing the fruit that God wants her to produce, that's your job. Mm -hmm. It's not the ministry. Mm -hmm. You took the responsibility to love that woman the way that Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And that's beyond before any call to ministry. Right. Yeah, that's good. So to bring it back to you and Sherry, what are some of the things that you did in terms of nourishing nourishing her? I mean, uh, specifically spiritually, did you guys? What did your guys' prayer life look together like? Like together, did you did you guys study the word together? Was there times the day, or that you set aside just the two of you where you would turn to Christ together? I know that there was lots that you did in terms of building an interpersonal relationship. Uh, certainly date nights or, or whatever, maybe, but, but in terms of spiritual things, how did you ensure that you were on the same page spiritually? You know, the way that I approached that with my wife is the same way that I approached it with my kids. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, you go to Deuteronomy chapter six and it says morning, noon, and night were to be teaching those kids. And I don't think the way that God designed that now, now man, I, I, Oh, I respect the people who do have the family altar and there's this time. I, I, oh, man, I think that's awesome. Mm -hmm. For me, the way that it worked is as a husband, I would share with my wife the things I'm studying mm -hmm. and the things that I was excited about. And, you know, I, you know I'm, I'm like, oh, baby, this is so awesome awesome and we would talk about the word of god in that way and she would ask about what i just said and and then and, and let me tell you about this part you know and so it was you know not no let, let, let's sit down and let me let me teach you right, right some right. things right. I, I, that, that's not me did she did she i mean she shared what she was learning from god's word too i suppose i'm sure it was, oh yeah it was a dialogue it, between the two of you yes and yeah. it's the same thing with with my kids now i would certainly you know pray with them at night and we would read together and i would talk with them i would sing how much with fun them. is that stuff by the way oh man because i'm still do i mean my kids are young enough where i'm still doing that stuff 
Yes. And, and you know what is so cool is there, there's this crazy little song that I used to sing to my kids and they sing them to their kids now. And so when Papa's over their house, Papa goes in. <laughs> And sings the song. You're going to sing it for us right now, aren't you? I am not. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't convince you to, to share this, the song? Uh, probably not. <laughs> you, you, a brother's got to know when to say no. <laughs> okay, perfect. Good. That's a great example right there. But in, in that Deuteronomy 6 example, it's a, a, as you're going. Mm-hmm. And so in spending time with my kids and you see this is the beautiful thing about nature is you know Romans 120 talks about right. the fact that everything in nature was created by God to manifest God mm-hmm. and so you know as we're going into we're taking bike rides and all of, you know taking walks or playing ball and sitting down and taking a breather you know that that's the way that it was working with our family it you know we we tried to do some you know formal type things and it just for us it felt formal Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) and you know so i i the, the way that we functioned is as we're going in life in real time yeah you know making it practical and the again in my little brain it's not that we step out of real life to do the God thing, but that God is a part of every part of our yeah, life. Yeah, it's a seamless thing. Yes, yeah. and and if that if somebody wants to critique that, I, I get it. You know, uh, well, brother, I'm a, you know I'm a family altar guy. Hey, hallelujah, man! I, I respect you, and I'm glad mm-hmm. that works for you. And if it works for you, do that. Yeah, right. <laughs> but. I, I was just never that guy. Sure. And I think it's different, different too, especially if you are a pastor. Your kids are getting, they got to sit under your preaching every single Sunday. And that feels formal because that's dad. And so I, I, I feel like it makes sense, especially in a, as a counterbalance to that. You don't want to s- sit down and have another teach time with the kids where you're being Mr. Pastor Dad. I think it is more important maybe in that type of setting to be gentle and more um, invitational and let's walk through life. And let me show you what, you know, what dad was preaching on Sunday. I actually want to, I live that out. Yes. Let, let me show you how I live that out. And let me invite you to do that with me. Let me model that for you. It might be more important, especially in that setting. Yes. And there's just so many things that, that we, you know, in working through books of the Bible, things that we've got to teach people about walking in the spirit and getting in the word and all of those kind of things that, man, if if that isn't what is modeled in our home and they hear us mm. preaching to people about the importance of that and they don't see that, okay, I can just about guarantee dog on to you, you're going to lose those kids. Yeah, that's tough. So here's a maybe going back just a little bit here. Can you tell me a, a, about a time? Maybe this is a little personal, but I'm going to try anyway. Um, where Sherry disagreed with a decision that you believed that the Lord had brought you to. In other words, where there are moments in ministry where there was disagreement, and then when there was, how, how did you work? through that what it looked like for you guys to get on the same page and 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 actually either compromise through that or wait and see or what did that maybe you can share a story i don't know well have i mentioned choose wisely yes (laughs) Um, yes yes. i think we're getting that for sure yes and and so uh this whole thing of submission um i think if a if a man, whether he's a pastor or just a, a husband, if you've got to play the submission card, you ain't being the husbandman with that plant. Mm-hmm. That that word has in forty one years has never crossed my lips nor my mind. 
And it's not that she agrees with me about everything, but you know, you go back to Genesis chapter one, and the commentary on Genesis chapter one is 1 Corinthians 11, that there was something God was doing by creating the man first. And the woman, what it says in the commentary, was created for the man. And yet, when you look at this thing, it says, and God blessed them Mm -hmm. and gave them dominion and told them to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Yes, the the leadership and the fellowship was there, but it was blended into this beautiful, harmonious oneness to where I don't think Adam ever said, woman, submit. And and so I'm I'm not trying to paint myself as uh, you know some great husbandman, but I will tell you this in in ministry and decisions and all of that. She's not the assistant pastor, but she is my help meet, mm-hmm. and she has gifts that I don't have. She really does, and one of those is discernment. Mm-hmm. And I. I love everybody. I believe everybody. And she is the sweetest person I've ever met in my life. And yet, She's discernment not is off the chain. Yeah. And she will sometimes share with me and say, I, I feel so terrible about saying this, but wow, I am just. And so I've tried to be very sensitive through the years to listen to my wife and Oh, I know this sounds like I'm trying to, you know, make it sound better than it's been, but we have never had a time to where we have disagreed about something, but I think it's because we're communicating about those things and the decisions are being made as a team. Yeah. Yeah. Man, so that's that's an incredible testimony about you and Sherry. And I, I know that there's a lot of men though who've married good women, women who love the Lord and and they want to do right by God, but maybe they're a little more strong-willed or, and their situations don't look exactly like yours does. And so what does it look like to learn to have that communication despite the fact that, that, that maybe they didn't, that the situation isn't quite as agreeable as, as yours was? Right, and uh, if if I sounded as if I'm trying to create us as the perfect couple in ministry, it, it is not that. I uh, it, it I give all the credit to my wife and all the credit to the Word of God in just that whole thing of seeing that we are a unit mm-hmm. in, in this thing. She is not the pastor, but she is my wife, and. <laughs> Her husband happens to be the pastor, yeah. and uh, again, so. But I, I get it. There's a lot of guys that get called to the ministry after they were married, and mm-hmm. they have the wife that they have, or in choosing wisely, they thought they were choosing wisely, and she, yet she demands more attention than my wife did. Mm-hmm. And so, I, I, I personally believe that you know that didn't come as a surprise to God that that guy has that wife. But what I believe with everything within me, that he needs to love that wife the way that Christ loved the church and give himself for her. And in doing that, he will learn to be the pastor that God wants him to be Mm -hmm. because he is modeling Christ and 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 seeing his wife bear fruit because he may not be spending as much time as I spent in the word. Mm-hmm. He may not have that luxury. He may have to spend mounds of time in a week to see his wife produce fruit. But God knows that, and that's how he's going to groom this guy to lead this flock because Mm -hmm. she's probably, as the bride, going to reflect a lot of what the bride of the church is is actually doing. And in learning to minister to her, he's actually going to be learning to minister 
to the flock. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So you're saying like a lot of the skills that you need to pastor actually come from the home, which is why when when the, you know, the Bible des- describes what the office of a bishop, the character qualities of a bishop should be, well, you need to have your house in order because in many regards, that is a, that is a reflection of what your ministry will look like. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And, and so it's, you know, I'm, I mean, if you can pick, then, you know, hey, pick somebody that wants to go in the ministry, that is passionate about that and is willing to sacrifice for that. Mm-hmm. But if that isn't what you have, minister to her and, you know, without being frustrated about how she's put together and how she's gifted and what she's not, you minister to her and and God will bless that yeah. and you will become, I, I really believe, a better pastor for what God has, the people he's caused you to be able to shepherd, yeah. you'll shepherd them in a greater way by learning to minister to your wife and see her bear fruit. Yeah, that's awesome. So so one more question. So how do you go about, uh, as, as a man of God, you know, you're, you're hearing from the Lord um, and, and you do have to make significant decisions that impact your whole family. How do you do that in a way that doesn't leave them behind? In other words, uh, what does it look like um, to to wait, to pray through, um, to communicate uh, in a way that ensures that your family is ready for the for the next step in ministry, whatever that might be? Yeah, and when we, you just mentioned in First Timothy three, you've got your house in order, and so you're uh, you're a shepherd mm-hmm. of your family first before you're shepherding a flock and so if if you're not shepherding your family to where uh they're on board then you're probably with where you're heading you're not going to be able to get them the the church to follow you either you're going to be leaving them behind and mm-hmm. so whatever you do to minister to your family to get them to where they're a part of that vision, whatever you do there is the same thing that mm-hmm. you're going to do with the flock mm-hmm. of God that we're shepherding. Sure, yeah. Because you hear these stories like about about great men of God, you know, like the William Carey's and the Hudson Taylors, and and the the forcefulness at, at which they brought their wives along sometimes um, seems really hard. I mean men of God like A.W. Tozer whose marriage ended in divorce and you you know these men had a call on their lives yet somewhere along the way there's a there's a, a breakdown in their approach to how they lead and uh, and so I, I think it, you know it's an ongoing battle I think with a lot of men in ministry is well the Lord wants this for me and I and I see it I see it in his word I see you know I know that how I know how I'm gifted and 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 then there's a disconnect in the home. And I think what you're saying is just so important uh, in terms of us learning how to to bring our family into deeper a deeper walk with the Lord. And it's like it's like all of this stuff happens in tandem, like the giving of new responsibility and capacity comes with a a growth in our in our family as well. I I believe that and I, I believe that, you know, there's men through the years that were so passionate about God and didn't really understand that responsibility that we have as husbands and fathers first Mm -hmm. and how this becomes the place of ministry first before the multitudes. And uh, through some of their mistakes, man, I feel like I've benefited like I talked about at the mm-hmm. beginning you know seeing some of those guys and you know note to self I never want my kids to feel like they got shafted yeah because their dad was a pastor man. <laughs> because they only get one daddy you know and wow man and so I uh yeah I I, I feel like you know, a guy like Tozer, man, what a what a heartbreak. And yet, 
he had so much insight into so many other things that have helped me in my life. Mm -hmm. But some of the failure in that other is, I don't want to repeat it. It's also a lesson. Yes. Yeah. And and so I've, I've learned from the theology and the practicality Mm -hmm. from a lot of these guys about God, but I've also learned the practicality of we, God established that home first. Yeah. And I I think as pastors that we, we need to realize we are husbands and fathers first and we are pastors after that. And I, I, I think in the ministry, it's real easy because I've been called of God. Mm-hmm. And to, to begin to think that our first responsibility is pastoring. Man, that's good, brother. Thank you. Well, thanks for uh, asking me my opinion about all of this. Well, I think it's pretty rooted in, in the word. So I don't mind asking. <laughs> and uh, I, I do also want you to plug real quick Wedstrong, because especially down in your part of the U.S., Wedstrong's a big deal. Uh, can you tell us about that just a little bit before we go? Yes. Yeah, so this is always the, the second week in December. Uh, we tried to uh, get it it's somewhat centrally located. It's not centrally located for those of you in the Midwest. But from anywhere from Florida to Ohio, we try to find a place somewhere in there. And this has been a pretty awesome thing. Last year, we had almost 500 uh, people that were at this thing. And it's a, it's a cool time. What we do is uh, we have a session on Thursday night. We have two on Friday morning and then at noon, until Saturday morning, you're free. And so you get the word, then you go get to have all kinds of fun with your family. We don't even have an evening one. Then Mm -hmm. we come back on Saturday morning for two more sessions. And again, from Saturday noon, it's it's get with your wife and and all of that. So we get five sessions and I do try to uh, weight those to Mm -hmm. where we're getting into the word. We don't do the frothy little, okay, now bring her flowers Mm -hmm. and you know all the cutesies it's we're going to the word and seeking to have a uh we call it wed strong so that we can be just that wedded strong in the word yeah that's great man 500 people man that's a that's a lot of couples and it's exciting. And so you guys are inviting people, the more the merrier. Sure. Come um, from the Midwest, man. We, so we, we usually go to Gatlinburg. Uh, uh, we've done it in Nashville. This time we're thinking maybe Asheville. Okay. Uh, COVID may determine something sure. uh, uh, on, on that. But, uh, man, I would love to see some Midwest folk come yeah, on out for that that thing it, it is a very cool gig well thank you for sharing some of that wisdom with us on the show and mark i love you love you too man i'm, I'm so grateful for you you Bless had you. such an impact on my life and i'm glad any opportunity i can share you with anybody else man i want to give <laughs> you a platform sweet, for that so so thank you and then hopefully we'll do this again we'll do some more interviews at mission focus i'll have a new set of questions to ask you if that's cool yeah let's do it man okay brother and we want to thank you as well for joining us we're we're grateful for you as well i know a lot of you guys are are regular listeners and uh, man we want to ask that if this is a blessing to you please share these with people please you know share this on your facebook page Uh, if you haven't yet subscribe subscribe at youtube subscribe on whatever platform you're using for your podcasts but we are so grateful for you and we are only doing this because we want it to be a blessing to you and this is why we're taking our time and so we love you and uh and if you're interested in in catching uh, more of what living faith fellowship is or what lfbi is you can visit lfbi.org or visit lffellowship.com to learn more about our fellowship of churches, how guys like Mark and I became friends because we're knit together over the same doctrinal truths and and a network of churches that are are, uh, dependent on the Lord in the same way. We wanna invite you to to join with us and, and, and hang with us. We love you, God bless, and we'll see you next week.
My name is Brian Bustos, and I am a Living Faith Bible Institute student. And I'm also a husband. And I'm also a father. In this stage in my life, things are definitely chaotic. I've been called by God to serve in my local church here in Kansas City. And in any given week, that may look like leading worship, or preparing for a Bible study, or even teaching a class. And this is where Living Faith Bible Institute is so important to my life. First, it gives me focus, but two, it's flexible. And so, if I can't make that Saturday morning class, I can still catch it online, whether it's remotely, or even sometime later in the week, like during my lunch break. I guess in essence, I don't have to put my life on pause. Enroll for classes at lfbi.org. If you are interested in donating to LFBI to support future pastors and leaders, please visit lfbi.org slash donate.